Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so this is uh, the US Asian Law Institute uh, weekly program uh, of the NYU Law School. Uh, so I'm based at uh, Duke Law School, but I'm a long term, uh, long -term uh, friend, uh, also affiliated member of the uh, US Asian Law uh, uh, Institute. So today we have a great honor and a pleasure uh, to uh, to welcome uh, Professor Yun Bangxin uh, from LSD to give us a talk about urban growth and the social movements in Asia. So Professor Xin uh, is a professor of geography and urban studies and the director of the Southeast Asian Center at the London School of Economics and the Political Science. Her research uh, focuses on the political economy of urbanization, uh, politics of displacement, gentrification, housing, the right to the city, uh, urban spectacles, and the speculative urbanism with particular attention to cities in Asia. These are all extremely uh, important uh, topics, uh, but I mean, also uh, equally or even more important uh, to, to Asian uh, cities. So before we start, I just want to let everybody know that next week, uh, US Asian Law Institute also has a very exciting program, um, a, a talk given by uh, partners of Paul Hastings about uh, combating anti-Asian hate, which is a, a very timely and important topic for Asian Americans. Uh, so um, that's going to be Thursday, September 29th. Uh, so this next week, uh, please register as early as possible uh, if you are interested. So that's for, for next week, okay? So with that, and without further ado, uh, Professor Xin, uh, the floor is yours or the room is yours. So thank you. please, thank you. Thank you very much uh, the, uh, for this very generous uh, introduction, uh, Professor Chow, and also many thanks to the Institute uh, for this invitation. So um, we're, my talk today is really uh, uh, about thinking uh, or about this question and the meaning of struggles over home uh, in times of deepening inequalities and what the implication of this uh, line of thinking is in, uh, for uh, uh, for the exploration of urban social movements. And here, you know, one of the keywords I would do in a book word and as a way of kind of shaping our thoughts and discussions is the uh, idea of in you know, a property uh, or property ideology as a uh, hegemony, uh, which has been very much influencing and shaping uh, the geography of you know, urban movement uh, these days. And also here, uh, additionally thinking about the, uh, the impact of uh, increasing speculative real estate market uh, and the, uh, the impact of this on people's uh, aspiration for, uh, uh, for property-based uh, accumulation, asset accumulation, which turns home into uh, asset. Uh, and this uh, transformation of home into asset um, increasingly being utilized as a way of hedging you know, uh, against future risks. And I guess this is something we, we see across the world and not just confined to uh, North America or Europe. Uh, it has also been the case in Asia, especially in the context of Asia's very rapid urbanization and economic development. And especially in the last in a couple of decades, uh, Asian families have also been very much, uh, or, I mean, they have always been you know, very much you know, paying attention to uh, securing home and property uh, uh, asset building. But I think this has all become particularly important issue uh, in current era uh, in Asia as well. And you can also kind of think about uh, such uh, uh, importance you know, when you uh, uh, pay a visit to um, the more recent history uh, in Asian cities, like the one in Taipei, where the housing protest in 2014 uh, received a lot of attention. And um, you can also think of um, the Hong Kong uh, protest in 2014 or 19, although it was uh, on, on larger issues, uh, the socioeconomic inequalities and especially the uh, unaffordable nature of housing and people's long you know, uh, 
queue to have access to public housing in Hong Kong. All of these were also you know, adding viewers to the, uh, the emergence of such uh, uh, urban protest in Hong Kong. And you can probably see in, a, in, a, in a many similar issues. And of course, in China, I mean, you, you have this you know, nail houses as the ultimate form, ultimate form of localized social activism, as argued by uh, Professor Yu Tian Singh. Um, and you know, these images, uh, for example, the one on the left hand side, which was actually giving rise to the popular popularization of nail house expression in uh, in China, uh, and this site is located in Chongqing. Um, leading to many similar images. And nowadays, you know, this nail house expression, which came up from China's you know, urban struggles, has also become a bit of an urban lexicon you know, across the world, you know, uh, more popularly used you know, to refer to similar phenomenon um, uh, across the world. So I think the two questions uh, that can be uh, our guiding questions here, and what it means to think about you know, claiming the right to the city and whose rights count. And here, of course, you know, my initial starting point will be the urban poor uh, who have less resources and, and power to resist an eviction uh, that has been enacted by the coalition of the state and businesses. And how are you to situate the housing rights just struggles in the rich history of local contestations? And here I, I would probably take you know, you know, one major case study that I uh, have been studying, you know, which is uh, South Korean experience. And of course, uh, I mean, this uh, case study will not be sufficient enough to address the wider you know, Asia-wide Asia -wide issues, but I think it can be a nice kind of entry point to think about the relationship between housing struggles and the larger social movement, and also you know, to situate this more historically in the context of the democratization movement South Korea has also been experiencing, and the labor struggles uh, against South Korea has been uh, well known for. And I guess that will allow us to further you know, have this conversation about the relationship between housing struggles and wider social movement, as well as the, uh, the, the labor movement as well. So let me, very, I'm not going into great details to explain the whole history of China and South Korea, but you know, you can probably see on the left-hand side that there has been this um, uh, summary that I put together here to indicate how in the 1960s and 1970s, we had, you know, South Korea has seen the dictatorship led by this uh, military general who was uh, basically the leader of the military coup uh, uh, that happened in 1961 uh, and, and have basically stayed in, uh, stayed in power until uh, 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 his assassination in 1979. Um, opening up you know, the doors for further you know, uh, uh, nationwide struggles and then, uh, these struggles were uh, already present in the, throughout the 1970s, but they were also again, erupting you know, in the 1980s. Combined with you know, the democratization movement, combining with labor movement as well, and the militant labor movement that South Korea was very known for in the 1980s and early 1990s, basically were characterizing uh, the, uh, the, the, the landscape of protest you know, in South Korea. We also see you know, um, the emergence of, uh, especially from the early 1980s, the more commercially oriented, larger scale urban redevelopment programs known as, known as Papdong Jegebal in Korean, or uh, if it literally translated into English, joint redevelopment. So small scale incremental exper experiments you know, before 1980, uh, which all, uh, all of which were leading to a major urban policy of joint redevelopment, uh, which was targeting substandard settlements that were home to many urban poor uh, residents uh, uh, in a city like Seoul. And that has basically you know, uh, 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 led to uh, the struggles that I'm uh, going to share with you today. In terms of the urbanization in the process, you can think of, you know, especially in, the, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the share of urban population, the national population, it was increasing quite rapidly throughout the 70s and uh, 80s. And, there, and here you can see the number. 57% you know, uh, uh, being the share of the urban population in national you know, uh, population in, uh, as of 1980, increasing to 874% in, in 1990 and reaching you know, 80% in 2000. And since then has been remaining more or less stable at uh, somewhere between 80% and 82%. Uh, and that's uh, the urban uh, share of the national population in South Korea. And of course, the 1970s, 60s, 70s, and 80s were uh, the time of you know, very you know, high speed and you know, 
uh, industrial development and of course South Korea you know, becoming export oriented economy uh, based on the, you know, uh, the, the labor uh, that was you know, put into low hours of working, low wage, uh, eventually uh, leading to some technological upgrading and, and becoming heavy industry manufacturing based in you know, a uh, uh, economy throughout the 80s and 90s. So all of these work in a kind of uh, providing the context within which I discuss you know, regarding the urban struggles. And here in a summary, uh, I can perhaps you know, you know, share you know, uh, very two distinctive characteristics. And when you look at the situation in the 1980s and the situation since 1990s. So throughout the 1980s, you can think of you know, the, uh, the reign of authoritarian developmentalism uh, which characterizes the South Korean political economy. Uh, and this was leading uh, to uh, the proliferation of clearance of urban slums, especially targeting those substandard you know, uh, settlements that were growing in large numbers uh, to become homes to many urban poor uh, families in uh, the country. Massive in uh, the commercially oriented redevelopment I was uh, sharing with you just now, uh, which began in 1983 and expanded in large scale very rapidly. And this was also the time of uh, on the authoritarian uh, developmentalist context, uh, the, the exercise of uh, state violence and oppression leading to uh, the dominance, domination of coercion uh, uh, being the major mode of uh, driving people to uh, certain destinies, uh, rather than you know, uh, uh, manufacturing consent. You know. And but the, all of these were gradually leading to the rise of very much more, very much a materialist property, uh, materialist culture, especially the joint redevelopment program uh, that was you know, emerging uh, and expanding very rapidly, contributing to the rise of uh, such in you know, a property in you know, a culture that can be found in the country. From the 1990s, we see in a demo, uh, uh, some uh, uh, positive effect of democratization movement in the 1980s and leading to further democratization and liberalization and and this also you know, is combined with the change of government you know, uh, of the first civilian and you know, a president being uh well the first president with the civilian background being elected in the early 19, uh, uh, 90s uh in 1992 1993 um and, and also the liberalization increasingly combined with you know, the growing you know, the influence of the neoliberalization that has been also you know, influencing uh, uh, the political economy of the country. And this is also where you know, we think of you know, uh, uh, these uh, urban struggles, especially those you know, uh, involving uh, urban poor families who are evicted from their uh, neighborhoods, increasingly coming together to demand for a you know, compensation, which wasn't, wasn't existing. Uh, in, in a meaningful sense you know, up until that moment, but this compensation scheme uh, for, for the first time being introduced on the basis of or benefiting and, and uh, benefiting from uh, these uh, 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 struggles uh, involving these tenants who are evicted from uh, uh, their neighborhoods. And from the 1990s, uh, with the help of you know, democratization, you get to see more uh, use of uh, manufacturing consent rather than the use of state violence, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, state violence uh, disappeared, but you know, there was more about this, you know, the property acting as hegemony uh, to manufacture this consent, which also means you know, increasingly even the poor people were gradually succumbing to this ideological uh, subordination as well. And Looking at more historically, you know, the uh, uh, struggles uh, in urban domain and what sort of you know, uh, discourses were evolving, you know, especially uh, when it comes to understanding uh, uh, the actions of you know, protesters, we get to see some interesting you know, changing characteristics, you know, uh, which involve you know, the emphasis on the right to subsistence or Seng Jong Kwon in Korean, uh, which was more or less the kind of keyword that was characterizing the struggles in the 1980s, moving to the emphasis on the right to housing uh, throughout the 1990s. Uh, and then you know, from 2000s, we get to see more about you know, the, right, the emphasis on the right to settlement. Um, and, and more recently, uh, uh, we get to see the emergence of 
the discourse on the right to the city. And the right to the city, of course, in, a, uh, in the US context, and you know, people are more uh, familiar with this in a uh, um, uh, uh, slogan. And if I may just briefly you know, introduce the background, you know, so in the, uh, up until the 1980s, you know, a lot of you know, protests are being you know, uh, seen, especially in those you know, settlements, which are subject to uh, uh, large scale demolition and redevelopment. So many protests emerging um, against the uh, forced eviction uh, uh, and these uh, residents were facing um, a very you know, different you know, socioeconomic and political conditions. You know, the, uh, the authoritarian context still continues, uh, uh, but it, it was becoming more uh, 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 com uh, complex and also the commercial the oriented redevelopment uh, combined with this in the country's increasing uh, degree of prosperity in a, an, on the basis of economic development led by the large conglomerate in South Korea, um, uh, all of which you know, came together to increasingly produce the material uh, culture uh, on the basis of property. Uh, but here, you know, the protesters were nevertheless were you know, basically you know, si uh, able to situate themselves uh, within the larger context of democratization movement in the 1980s, within the context of, again, the labor movement, which were uh, increasingly characterizing the country in the 1980s, uh, especially the large you know, factories you know, you know, coming together to produce these trade unions and, and militant you know, uh, 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 opposition to uh, the undemocratic government and also you know, the, uh, their employers as well. Um, and tenant protesters uh, largely making the demand in a, which was centered on governmental provision of alternative relocation housing um, and the, you know, the, uh, the implementation of uh, uh, demanding for the implementation of compensation measures since you know, they didn't have anything meaningful in, a, uh, in the forms of compensation when they were evicted initially. And also what is interesting is despite the brutality, despite the uh, brutality from the state, developers and land the lodge and these uh, evicted tenants were trying to reason with the state uh, framing their demands in such a way that their claims could be legitimate and uh, seen to be reasonable and hence hoping to avoid any deni uh, denigration uh, socially or politically protesters demanding public rental housing for their relocation and this not to be framed as a gift or, or no freebies from the state uh, but something that the poor would strive to be financially responsible. Again, this is uh, uh, speaking to the first previous point about you know, the tenants trying to region with the state and when they were uh, making these demands. And this is one of the pictures you know, that was emphasizing the, the, uh, the right to subsistence, uh, a more historic image, one of the historic images of uh, tenant protesters in southern part of Seoul. But from the 1990s, you get to see a little bit in a different story you know, where there's a, a more emphasis on, well, not just about this the right to subsistence, but a more specific you know, uh, demand for the right to housing or housing rights. And this is a new language that has been, uh, that was introduced um, and they're, uh, uh, in order not to confine their protest to their right to subsistence only, but expanding this to encompass housing rights or Jugokwon in Korean. And this is also um, in the context of uh, uh, acquiring this, you know, uh, uh, some the, some forms of compensation that was introduced in, in uh, 1989, um, and on that basis, you know, a greater recognition of the need of in you know, gaining and acquiring this uh, the housing rights. Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, which is uh, Asia-wide in, in a housing uh, rights organization, uh, uh, which uh, has, has been uh, very active uh, in the region. Uh, also in a, uh, making this uh, uh, visit to uh, South Korea as a fact-finding mission to find out the scale of you know, demo, uh, displacement among these you know, poor people. And it was uh, this report that came out in 1988, which was actually producing the number of about 720,000 people in Seoul alone were uh, affected by uh, the displacement uh, that was happening between 1983 and 1988. There was about probably about 10% of the entire Seoul population uh, which was being affected by this displacement pressure. And, and they're also uh, uh, leading to further awareness of the need of you know, claiming this right to housing. Uh, 
And there was also 1996 uh, uh, and Habitat 2 conference, which was about basically this you know, housing issues. And, and some of the activists you know, from Korea were also you know, taking part, especially those leading groups of activists in, uh, in housing arena, uh, being part of the Habitat 2 conference and, and also that you know, fed back into the urban struggles in South Korea. And this was in, involving, uh, for example, in the 1990, uh, the establishment of more nationwide you know, assembly of the National Coalition of Housing Rights, well, basically the National Coalition of Housing Rights. And this is the picture of the inaugural assembly in 1990, uh, 3rd of June. Then eventually we see uh, the expansion of this concept you know, uh, to demand for the right to human settlement. So not just about the housing, but about the need of you know, uh, uh, having more uh, habitable uh, 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 neighborhood or settlement in you know, uh, the larger district you know, uh, um, uh, to be the main focal point of you know, its progress. Uh, and this was also coinciding with the, the changes to the urban policy at the time, especially in the early 2000s, where the larger scale mega develop, redevelopment you know, in being introduced you know, by Seoul municipal government at the time and became a very heated in you know, a point of in you know, a political debate. Um, um, and that was you know, uh, basically you know, uh, leading to this you know, greater awareness among activists uh, to uh, frame their struggles you know, uh, uh, within the context of you know, uh, uh, this increasing pressure uh, to, uh, uh, to implement this larger scale mega, uh, mega uh, district level uh, redevelopment schemes. Uh, and therefore, you know, the right to human settlement being one of the main slogans at the time. So uh, one of the quotes you know, from the National Council Center for, uh, to, uh, uh, for Victims of uh, Forced Eviction in 2003, basically saying, uh, uh, kind of established in, uh, in order to help in, uh, uh, such uh, struggles. And this is probably where we get to uh, think perhaps just one more thing. In, a, in a, the, the last point in a, where uh, we get to see more uh, uh, discussions about uh, the importance of the right to the city, especially in the last 10 years. And this was also um, uh, this was actually uh, uh, precipitated uh, by this uh, tragedy uh, uh, that gained a lot of attention in, a, in uh, about 10, 20, uh, 14 years ago, um, where uh, a violent uh, a suppression of a protest in a, uh, 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 by uh, uh, a special police squad in a, leading to the death of six tenant protesters and one policeman. And that was basically occupying uh, the minds of many uh, uh, civic groups as well as the activists and, and therefore leading to uh, uh, more discussion about the right to the city itself. And this was also quite an interesting uh, uh, moment because these uh, protest tenant protesters were not residential tenants, but commercial tenants, especially those small shop owners who are renting you know, properties to run their own shops. So uh, these tenant, uh, commercial tenant protesters were the major focal point, and this is where it gets quite, uh, 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 takes us to an interesting point of you know, how the 80s and 90s struggles were largely about residential tenants and, and the residential and uh, urban poor families you know, whose homes were being uh, 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 demolished and, uh, and their livelihood being threatened. Whereas you know, in more recent years, uh, especially uh, 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 with the influence of this in a particular tragedy that was affecting uh, commercial tenants, we get to see a bit more about, hey, we have left out the question of you know, protecting the, the right of you know, these small you know, commercial tenants uh, who are uh, kind of lying outside the kind of you know, the, uh, 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 protection that was uh, achieved you know, by the struggles of uh, of ten, uh, residential tenants you know, throughout the 80s and 90s. So my kind of second last slide is really about this, these, uh, think uh, uh, some further in a point of in a consideration when you think of in you know, urban movement. Um, and this is where the property, you know, going back to the issue of property hegemony and you know, being one of the key you know, uh, constraint, acting as constraint, you know, especially because the whole uh, uh, rise of you know, people's aspiration to build a you know, property asset, increasingly affecting poor people as well as you know, middle classes. 
And many of, uh, very often, you know, redevelopment is seen to be a uh, uh, progress in societal development. You know, basically, turning you know, uh, a shabby you know, a dilapidated set in the neighborhoods into something fancy uh, uh, and, and, and uh, good looking in terms of appearance, uh, as well as improving the condition of living itself you know, by providing more uh, updated you know, residential properties all seem to be uh, in a very much in a positive in a, uh, uh, outcomes and therefore seem to be a societal in a, uh, progress, even though many poor people do not actually have, uh, 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 do not, many poor people are not actually able to be able to take the benefit of such transformation. But this kind of recognition and basically affecting the wider in a societal in a discourse and therefore marginalizing the voices of the poor as, at, at the same time. So in conclusion, what I'm trying, what I was trying to you know, kind of briefly share today is this, uh, these points, are these points, you know, the examination, uh, I was trying to have a more historical understanding going back to the 1970s, 80s and 90s and 2000, trying to, uh, by, by means of uh, uh, examining the, the genealogy of urban rights discourses. Uh, I was also trying to kind of you know, highlight the fact that you know, the urban poor was very knowledgeable and they understood you know, what was at stake and also the political economic context within which their uh, fate was situated. There were ample evidences, uh, pamphlets that was a, a, able to have access to, and you know, some of the interviews that I was able to carry out with the uh, uh, former activists and so on. They were very much aware of uh, this, this, for example, this uh, strong alliance between the state elite and business elite. And they were really seeing the detrimental impact of such commercial uh, 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 process of urban change led by the state you know, and also the, the businesses uh, very much you know, uh, negatively impacting their conditions of living and therefore they were fully you know, aware of this, especially among the leading groups of activists. There's a, there, there, there is ample evidence of awareness and therefore in this regard, the redevelopment crushes the urban force and the right to subsistence and is an ultimate form of money making. Uh, on, built on the struggles in the 80s and 90s and, and, and early 2000, of course, and, uh, we have you know, established this uh, in the country, the National Basic Housing Rights Act uh, in 2015, which was one of the major demands among the you know, protesters in the, throughout the years. So this can be seen as the culmination of the effort made by, made by the progressive social movement. Um, and all of these were starting from the 1990s, by the way, so it took you know, almost 20 years for that to come into effect. And of course, there's always this, uh, these uh, competing visions of an ideal city and a social, socially just city, um, especially you know, those who are uh, asset rich and asset poor, and also those who are able to uh, benefit from such you know, urban changes and those who are unable to, and also and then there's also the question of how much the urban poor are being affected by this you know, uh, hegemonic ideology built on you know, property uh, 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 being equal to uh, uh, asset. Um, and I guess uh, uh, I guess that's all probably. You know, uh, uh, I think the remaining part is fairly you know, uh, repetition of what I was just trying to explain just now. So I think I stopped there and hand over back to Professor Chow. Thank you so much, Professor Shin, for the wonderful uh, talk. Uh, I'm also, I'll say, I'm all for the right to safety and also the right to housing. Um, so, um, so for participants, I think uh, you should, if you're interested, you should start putting in uh, basically your questions uh, in the chatting box, right? So that, and you know, right. So start doing that if you if you plan to do uh, to ask questions. But mean, meanwhile, I have a, a couple of questions just to. To, to start the discussion. So firstly, I'd like to invite you, uh, Professor Shin, to, to, uh, to define or help me understand uh, better the scope of your uh, research or what you mean specifically the property uh, hegemony, right? In my understanding of your talk, there are uh, two uh, possible uh, definitions of the property hegemony. Why is what you have said at the beginning and at the end, right? This human passion, uh, right? Or the human aspiration for owning assets or owning a, a home, right? 
that reminds me of uh, uh, an essay on The Economist, uh, I think one or two years ago, which claims that home ownership is the biggest mistake or one of the biggest mistakes uh, human beings have ever made. Right? We don't have to own a home. We just, we just need the right to housing, right? The right to, to city, right? And then because of this desperate, that desperate uh, demand for, for housing, I mean, together with other factors, right? You create this speculative market, and then this speculative market leads to what you have discussed more specifically, like a redevelopment and the displacement uh, of urban poor, uh, or, you know, basically everywhere in the in the world, right? In different cities uh, in Asia, etc. So that's that's one like a very uh, ambitious uh, and broad claim to say it's property rights. This ideology or this system itself, right, is actually wrong. That's one. Uh, one my like one of my understandings of the scope of your research, but the other one, uh, my understanding of your, your research, I mean more specific is talk, right? It's, it's more specific. It's about redevelopment, right? It's about urban poor. They didn't they didn't get a conversation. They didn't get a housing, right? That's why they claim the right to substance, the right to housing, the right to the city eventually, right, or the right to uh, human settlement. That's that's very much related to the, the how say the, the context of of, of 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 urban redevelopment, right? And in that sense, I would I mean I, I'm probably wrong. I would understand your property hegemony more as the uh, the, the property developers hegemony. I'm asking this because I want to apply right or to understand your research from a, a comparative context, right? Your empirical study here. Uh, focus on uh, South Korea, which is, is fascinating, right? Uh, but I'm thinking of like, for example, the pictures that you have shown about Taipei, uh, about uh, Hong Kong, right? And about uh, the new house in Southwestern uh, China, right? You talk about housing affordability or un housing unaffordability. Because at the beginning, I thought you were going to talk about basically, I mean, by, by seeing those pictures, I thought about, I thought about you were talking about a social movements generally speaking, against uh, housing unaffordability. That's something I myself is extremely interested in, and myself has done actually some research, including a recent paper about uh, Hong Kong. So I uh, co-authored a paper actually with another, uh, with the NYU law professor, uh, Professor Rick Hill, right? Uh, so what we found actually very interesting in Hong Kong is that there have been so many social movements and so many protests in the past two decades, but there is not a single protest against housing unaffordability. Actually, there are there were small protests against the government's plan to build more public housing because the more supply of housing could potentially uh, negatively impact the housing price, therefore negatively impacting uh, the property value of the homeowners. Of course, that could be another evidence to uh, demonstrate what you call the property hegemony. But what we found interesting is that there is a lack of social movements or protests uh, against housing unaffordability. And also your high pay example, I'm really interested in that. So I read the, the, the posters, right? It's in uh, traditional Chinese. But what I saw is that those are against the, the coalition of business and the power, right? What you said, the colonialism. So I didn't say like a specific protest or words against the housing unaffordability. So the Southwestern China, the new house in Chongqing or the new house in Tianjin, those are, I think, I think more related to your uh, empirical research uh, about South Korea, right? Those are against social, against urban redevelopment. But that's also a case, I think kind of, uh, again, uh, you remind me to think about the scope of your research and also like what's exactly your critique of this uh, property hegemony. I'll just talk about the uh, the, the, the new house, the, what they call the, the coolest new house, right? Uh, in Chongqing of Southwestern China. So what happened afterwards is that that couple, right? Who owned that new house, eventually they got a pretty handsome conversation or the, the, the outcome of their protest is, 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 is actually they got enough money to satisfy their aspiration for ownership to get a luxury house or an apartment somewhere else, right? 
So I, I, I mean, I'm sure the South Korea story is, is different. I'm just thinking about, again, right, when you talk about the urban poor in, in Seoul, when they claim right to housing, right to city, what exactly do they claim? Do they want another piece of property? Do they want ownership? Therefore become, a, I don't know, slaves of this property hegemony or victims of this property hegemony? Or they just want a right to housing or right to city? Uh, so what does that mean exactly? So that's, that's my question. I'm sure the audience will have a lot of questions. So uh, I think we'll handle public question one by one. So please, Professor Xin. I think you are muted. You are muted. <laughs> After you know, two and a half years of in a, in a Zoom world, you, know, you still have this, <laughs> you're muted. You know, probably the most, one of the most frequently spoken expressions uh, in, in Zoom space these days. Sorry about that. Well, I was saying, you know, uh, 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 thanks so much, you know, Professor Chiao, you know, for those very uh, wonderful you know, in the comments and questions. I mean, those are really all relevant in you know, a point, you know, uh, to uh, point which are relevant to, uh, and uh, to, to the talk today and uh, to what I uh, have been arguing and, and uh, uh, working on. And I mean, there are many points that came out, so you know, let me try to you know, take them you know, one by one. Um, well, maybe backward, I mean, name house, I mean, that's an interesting you know, question, of course. I mean, yes, and it is true, the, the couple or the, the, the male protester eventually got in a, a hefty in a sum of in a compensation. And we have like an expression in China, like you know, this kind of overnight millionaire, and <laughs> name house millionaire, kind of, uh, which has also become a source of an you know, interesting debate uh, as well. Um, but I think, you know, uh, it, it, it's also probably useful to uh, 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 acknowledge the fact that you know, this nail house and the phenomenon is also being uh, shaped in such a way that uh, 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 produces certain degree of stigmatization. You know? um, so you know, they are, it is being framed in a very material way you know, and therefore you know, it's always kind of in a, in a, in a protest against in a, in a major a demand for major compensation. You know? um, Without really considering other aspects of you know, and hardship and, and and despair and so on, so this is probably where you know, some critics talk about you know, the multiple aspect of you know, uh, inadequate recognition you know, that is associated with these you know, people who are being subject to uh, uh, displacement, even in China. So when it comes to nail house uh, phenomenon, you know, yes, we need to recognize the. The absence of their political uh, uh, agency or the the, the the various aspects, economic and you know, social, psychological, and, and so on, all these kind of issues are, are in need of you know, recognition, and therefore, uh, the economic recognition is not the is only one of many uh, that will be uh, uh, driving the uh, the actions of uh, these families who may be staging these these protests. And we only you know, get to hear you know, in mainstream media reports or you know, in, in popular discourses the economic aspect of you know, such demand and, and therefore um, uh, producing very uh, uh, narrow understanding you know, uh, in popular discourse, and which also makes it very difficult to fully capture uh, the extent to which uh, the hardship that these families may endure. Um, what do what do they ask for, and what what, else, what is their demand for? I mean, this goes back to also the question of you know what these protesters in, in South Korea uh, are asking for, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you, know, you may get to hear again in, in various you know, slogans and pamphlets, which are more or less kind of simplified. I mean, the most the more simple they are, the more effective they can be, you know, right? I mean, although it, uh, uh, underneath the uh, simplified version of the slogan. There will be a more kind of complex array of you know, uh, uh, issues you know, uh, that are part of it. So on the surface you know, of these you know, demands, you, of course, you get to see you know, we need housing. You know. We need you know, you know, alternative you know, you know, uh, re re relocation housing. We need money you know, uh, to pay for our relocation. We need you know, uh, uh, you know, economic support you know, to, uh, to survive you know, you know, when you, uh, Get in you know, a displaced. All these things are obviously in the capitalist in the, in the economy it comes down to monetary issues. But you know, in my own interviews with many you know, people who are in a similar situation, who are in those situations, I mean, 
once you start digging into it, it it it, go, it becomes a much bigger issue. Right? It's not just about the money. It's about again, a kind of a, their long term association with the place, you know, their relationship with the neighborhood, you know, their intra family in the relations, um, and also their own dignity. Uh, uh, and so all of these, in you know, uh, emotional, you know, political, you know, uh, and cultural, all these actually are packed together. Uh, but they don't get expressed as such. You know? And when it comes to these struggles, you, know, you get those you know, uh, 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 highlighted in the demands, which are usually associated with monetary you know, compensation or in-kind uh, in compensation. But what goes underneath the minds of these people are, will be much more complex. Right? So, um, and I think this is where you know, uh, it, it'll be useful to think of you know, uh, such struggles in line with you know, the wider you know, the demands in the society you know, for their own you know, survival. And, and this survival is not just going to be about economic survival only, but basically having a place in the society uh, and, and uh, being recognized as a, as a, you know, a meaningful contributor, uh, a meaningful member of the society is what probably uh, uh, what is being you know, uh, um, very much at the center of you know, what they really you know, aspire to. And of course, there's also you know, the issue of um, thinking about the growing gap between you know, these you know, protesters um, in terms of their economic condition and the rest of the society, you know, especially talking about the, the, the average you know, the, uh, uh, level of you know, living conditions. You know, as the economies in Asia grow really rapidly and has grown really rapidly you know, during the last you know, three, four decades, and we have seen uh, in some studies, you know, what was achieved in terms of economic you know, growth, you know, when it, and there's a, this, uh, one study I open cite is the study by uh, a couple of economic geographers, one of whom is uh, Mick Dunford, you know, uh, who is now uh, uh, based in China, actually, who's from the UK, but based in China, in Chinese Academy of Science. And, and, and their paper was talking about how in measured in terms of uh, uh, the real GDP per capita, uh, and if you take the uh, uh, the real GDP per capita at the time of economic takeoff of a country, and see how many years it takes for the country to increase, to have a fivefold increase in real GDP per capita, and they were actually looking at historically, you know, what the data was showing, and they were they found out, you know, like the country like the UK, which was in the, one of the first industri industrializing com uh, country, and then in the in the 18th and 19th century, they, it took the UK 160 years for that fivefold increase in real GDP per capita to be achieved, whereas China, South Korea, Hong Kong, or Taiwan, Singapore, in the late 20th century, they have only taken about about 25 to 28 years only. So that huge and you know, high pace to develop, high speed development was also producing very rapid uh, you know, growth of you know, people's affluence at, as well. You know, and, and this, of course, you know, speaking of average, right? But this also meant, you know, you know, in the course of 1970s and 80s and, and 1990s, you know, uh, 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 process of you know, urban transformation that was combined with you know, very rapid economic development, combined with you know, uh, neighbor changes producing the huge scale of demolition, displacement, demolition, and reconstruction. And it's very you know, common to you know, come across in, in the case of China, like uh, buildings which are only 10, 20 years old, being subject to demolition and reconstruction to build new properties, right? So people actually see in front of their eyes and how old properties give way to new properties and how this process was basically producing huge amount of increase in property value. And you get, and this also uh, naturally producing this kind of uh, despair among those people, especially the urban poor families and you know, whose properties are being demolished and who don't have to actually have the means to have access to new properties. Um, and, and this also you know, becomes a major source of uh, the economic claims as well. And, and I think this is why probably economic claims are being a lot more emphasized and uh, uh, way more than other non-economic claims and, and the issues of, you know, despair and uh, less uh, emphasized and partly because of the growing you know, the emphasis on property you know, based accumulation and also partly because of the increasing gap uh, between the haves and have nots 
And here, let me just gonna, you know, uh, finish my you know, response by simply saying, you know, uh, uh, providing a response to your first point about the definition of property hegemony. And, and this is, is, of course, very, very much a multifaceted you know, definition. It includes you know, the aspiration being the major you know, uh, uh, influencing factor among people, the aspiration to build property asset. It also uh, uh, refers to the developers being a hegemonic, uh, the important player um, in the societal transformation. It also uh, refers to uh, property you know, uh, being the major uh, means of you know, uh, asset accumulation, but also uh, prosperity. And the whole total value of you know, property and you know, asset in the national economy becoming very influential and, and, and domin dominant. So all of these are actually you know, you know, put together you know, uh, and therefore it's uh, multiple meanings, uh, not just one. That's, that's great. Uh, thank you, Professor Shin, for the uh, very, uh, very helpful uh, reply. I do agree with you that uh, the human dimension and also the political dimension, uh, right, and also the social dimension about uh, uh, economic and social equality, that have been, uh, as you have said, uh, uh, neglected or even, uh, or say the least, uh, underappreciated in the rapid urbanization process uh, in Asia. So we already have wonderful questions from the audience. So the first one uh, is from uh, Professor Jose Alvarez, who is also uh, the faculty uh, director of the uh, US Asian Law Institute at NYU uh, Law School. So his question is that uh, South Korea has been a party uh, since 1981 uh, to the International Covenant on Economic social and cultural rights, which includes the right to adequate housing. So as a member right, of this, uh, or this covenant, right, Korea must have gone through uh, various uh, iterations of state reporting and criticisms by the committee right, of the ICESR, uh, right? So that committee's jurisprudence is rich on what a right to housing means and what a process the state had to accord before forcing an eviction. So Professor Alvarez uh, is curious if these treaty obligations, right, the international community uh, or the obligations uh, have played any role in the activist movement uh, Professor Shin has described, right, or played any role in pressuring the government to adopt a rights approach. And incidentally, uh, the, uh, the, the covenant, right, of the, right or the international treaties, they do not require governments to adopt a particular ownership regime or titling regime, right? They require only rights to access enjoyment, but not necessarily formal ownership in the absence of discrimination. So as I understand it, the question is whether international treaties obligations, right, that play any role in the activist movement or in or particularly like in pressure the government to take any actions. So. Mm. Well, that's a, again, excellent question. Um, well, my under, understanding is, I think, uh, in the South Korea ratified in this in, in 1919, so you know, quite a while ago. And, and here, I, I would probably you know, return to what I was uh, saying about the, uh, the provision of you know, compensation you know, to EVPs, you know, uh, which was you know, coming into effect in 1989. So this is where it gets quite interesting, right? 1989, you know, on the basis of many uh, 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 strong well, demands you know, coming from you know, you know, EBPs in you know, the early 1980s, when this commercial redevelopment started to uh, take effect, and many you know, tenants, you know, is, uh, uh, poor tenants were evicted without any compensation. They, basically, they were driven away from their homes you know, uh, 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 overnight and without any, any promise. I mean, there was a case by case kind of negotiation, of course, in you know, the some more uh, generous landlords you know, uh, might have given some uh, individually you know, uh, um, and, and there might have been some small scale kind of a success here and there, but institutionally there was no provision you know, for compensation to be given out. In, in, you know, uh, and this was you know, more meaningfully introduced in 1989, where, uh, uh, which was basically requiring you know, the landlords and developer to do a survey you know, at the time of you know, implementing this you know, redevelopment to do a survey on eligible tenants. And there was a like, eligibility criteria to do a survey and ask you know, who wants to be rehoused. And, and anyone, you know, based, on, based on the numbers of people who responded you know, 
uh, uh, to obtain to rehousing units, they have to provide it on, uh, uh, on the site or elsewhere. So, and the provision of rehousing was in the form of public rental housing, which was again for the first time introduced in a meaningful way in South Korea in 1989. Now, into being introduced in 1989 doesn't mean everyone being benefiting from this overnight. You know, it, it takes a long years you know, uh, you know, for this to be meaningfully you know, you know, really you know, taking effect. Uh, but what is also interesting is, well, even though this was put in place and therefore, you know, and this is one of the reasons why you know, some of the you know, housing you know, uh, uh, protests and struggles were moving to another direction. So it was much less about compensation itself. And they were like, you know, where we have so more or less kind of, you know, there was a bit of a recognition that we solved initially the problem of you know, uh, tenant eviction. Uh, since we have in, now institutionalized you know, this you know, protection for tenant evictees, uh, in the forms of uh, rehousing, public uh, rental housing as rehousing unit, and therefore we have, you know, so, you know, so there was a bit of recognition that the problem was solved, and therefore people moving on to some other methods. So this is where throughout the 1990s, again, uh, uh, further supported by this, you know, further democratization of the, you know, of the South Korean state, we have more kind of emphasis on housing welfare you know, becoming another emergent issue uh, throughout the 1990s. So rather than in a struggle against the eviction itself, it was more about kind of general welfare dimension associated with the living uh, the conditions and, and the, the livelihood. So there was this kind of growing recognition of the need of you know, you know, improving the welfare dimension um, uh, throughout the 1990s. Um, so that's probably uh, one of the you know, kind of you know, uh, uh, impact of, I guess, you know, this you know, uh, measure introduced in 1989 followed by you know, this ESRC, uh, uh, ESCR, uh, sorry, uh, 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 recognition and so on. What is also interesting here, and, and the second point I'm trying to make here is you know, uh, the, the landlords and developers' practices have become more sophisticated. <laughs> so while staying within broader, broader limit of you know, this and you know, the protection that they have to you know, uh, provide you know, according to the law, now there were many other ways of you know, basically going uh, you know, evading this, and this is probably what you know, can be seen in a country like China as well. You know, we have a lot of these you know, which are uh, protected by by law, you know, but then there are many other loopholes and many other ways of you know, uh, you know, escaping you know, uh, uh, the requirement. And therefore, this the same thing has happened in South Korea, and therefore. Many of these you know, you know, eligibility and you know, becoming the major starting point for determining who is you know, able to have access to rehousing. So you know, a lot of people were you know, driven away you know, uh, before they were able to make the claims on rehousing. You know, and there will be many other ways of you know, reducing the number of people who can be benefiting from you know, such you know, uh, compensation and you know, in-kind compensation. Um, so there's a, there are many of these uh, more sophisticated way of uh, uh, exercising the rights of developers and right of uh, more uh, affluent landlords. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Shin. I'd like to actually, uh, I mean, we have other great questions from audience, but I like to just intervene to follow up uh, with a very minor point. So uh, that the uh, international like a uh, covenant right on economic, social and cultural rights or just uh, other like ideas uh, from, for example, the West, uh, do they have played like any specific role in the narratives or in how activists, how they structure, how they frame uh, their claims. Uh, another related thing I'm thinking about is the right to the city, which you know much more than I do, uh, which I understand is kind of uh, the origin of the right to the city, the more like a Western idea, right? But currently I see the idea kind of being spread, at least spread by intellectuals, by, but, but also maybe some activists in Asia, right? To talk about the right to the city. I'm just wondering whether such, you know, cross the country, whether it's from international covenants uh, treaties or just ideas like such as the right to the city from Western countries, whether that have an impact on the narratives on how activists frame uh, their claims or shape their strategies of, 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 of social movements. Yeah. Well, I, I have to admit in, a, in terms of the, in a, uh, uh, in terms of finding out whether there's any direct connection between the covenant and in the people's you know, discourse, I mean, at this time, uh, the evidence itself is not you know, quite there for me to present. I mean, uh, and probably this is going to be quite tricky, actually. Um, 
but I would probably, you know, if you remember, you know, one of my presentation uh, slides was referring to like the 1996 you know, Habitat 2 conference, for example, which was about affordable housing and, and so on. And, I mean, there was basically you know, what was also you know, feeding back into the kind of discussions and, and, and the you know, debates that were taking place uh, um, in those in that conference and, and, and the subsequent, I mean, the kind of you know, preparation that was necessary for the delegates you know, uh, uh, from Korea you know, when they were attending the conference and the kind of feedback from the conference to you know, Korean you know, activist groups and uh, housing rights groups and you know, all these things you know, were, uh, I'm sure, you know, would have uh, this you know, it would have made an influence. Um, the same goes to um, um, what is it the um, the right to housing as well. I guess in a, it's, I mean yes, there's a you know, uh, greater you know, uh, popularization of uh, such a you know, slogan, you know, um, uh, which was you know, quite you know, I guess meaningfully observed in in in, uh, in the West. You, know, um, and you can you have the, or the occupy movement you know, and especially in you know, which was. Uh, contributing further uh, to further popularization of the right to uh, city, right to housing, uh, right to the city in particular, and this was also in you know, a feeding to into uh, feeding back to uh, South Korea as well, and especially by you know, uh, some some uh, more leading activists and also uh, critical scholars you know, who are basically you know, uh, engaging with such debate and using those you know, uh, back in. Uh, uh, the Korean context and as a way of explaining and making uh, shaping the claims. What is also probably useful to also acknowledge is throughout the 80s and 90s, you know, the activist groups were involving a lot of these critical scholars as well as the student activists you know, who are working closely with you know, urban poor people. Um, and that in you know, a close nexus and, and close interaction between the two also you know, leading to this uh, some of the academic concepts kind of in a, in a, in a kind of in a, making their way into the discourse and uh, among the poor people and you know, when they were making staging their protest. And so I think that's also you know that you know the import of you know, some of the concepts into those you know, uh, protester landscape uh, uh, by means of you know uh, through the channels of the student activists you know, who are influenced heavily by this critical literature that was coming from the West um, or from uh, from Latin America in particular. Uh, as well as the the uh, 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 more socialist kind of socialist uh, literature uh, from Europe uh, and so on, uh, having an impact on uh, the discourse shaping as well. Oh, that's 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 wonderful to hear. Before I uh, move on to the next question from the audience, uh, I'll also just access my privilege to ask a probably a related question. Uh, uh, just uh, you know, came to my mind when you talk about basically how they. Uh, habitat international, right? Uh, how that connected to the, uh, the the social movements of uh, housing uh, in South Korea. I guess I just want to ask. Uh, I mean, firstly, uh, uh, um, a very basic question: like, who are those activists? I mean, not. I mean, this act like housing activists in South Korea. Are they the those evictees? People were being uh, displaced, or because I think a fascinating aspect of your talk and also of your research is talking about, I think, the connections between the housing social movements in South Korea and so on, right? And is a connection with the big background, for example, the democratization in South Korea. I think that's, that's just fascinating, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if like, whether it's more like, for example, in China, I also say, uh, I mean, farmers or just in urban redevelopment, you have protesters who, you know, uh, got to connect with each other, to learn from each other, to share knowledge, right? Uh, to about how to, you know, bargain, how to organize the protest, right? And that's one kind of uh, social movement. But you could also have something like authoritarian regimes that would be more concerned about, right? So the urban poor or the re the, the displacements of, of, of urban poor becomes a cause for the uh, for the bigger social and the political movement in the, in the case of South Korea, could it be like, I don't know, I, I'm imagining, could it be also a cause for the uh, democratization or at least for the uh, democracy activists to use it to, you know, against the, the authoritarian regime to say, this is why we need a more just system, a, a more equal system, and which the authoritarian regime cannot provide. So my question is, who are they, right? These activists and what are their claims only about yeah. housing or about more. So thank you. Well, thank you again for this very you know, important question. Um, 
So who are these people? And my direct answer to that is that it, it, it would usually include two groups of people. And one is, you know, where those more, uh, uh, usually those, you know, you know uh, students or, you know, were usually students, and especially in the, in the 1980s and you know, 70s and 80s, students were those some more religious groups as well, you know, especially Catholic church, you know, uh, or some more, uh, some uh, Protestant, you know, uh, 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 groups you know, who were influenced by well, actually South America's liberation sociology, uh, liberation theology. Uh, I and mean, those were more kind of you know, those uh, groups of people you know, who are politically having a political awakening you know, um, in the 70s and, uh, and 80s and kind of finding their ways into more grassroots you know, you know, activism. Uh, so they were you know, either moving into uh, uh, like uh, you know, factories, you know, one group was moving into factories. <laughs> Uh, to organize workers. Another group was moving into these poor settlements, you know, uh, substandard settlement neighborhoods where urban poor were living and trying to basically help them out, help them, and also organize them. Um, some were going to more kind of rural areas as well. So they were kind of moving to all different directions, right? And, um, and especially, of course, in the late 70s and well, 1980s when labor movement was very uh, uh, influential. A lot of these you know, students who are, uh, who are politically you know, active were uh, you know, making their ways in large numbers to, to factories, you know, basically becoming factory workers, uh, abandoning their student status and becoming factory workers. And quite a few of them actually remained to uh, continue as factory workers without returning to schools. And they were basically uh, one of the major bases of uh, uh, the, the, the basis of uh, the leftist party. You know, that was emerging in the uh, late 90s and early 2000. This one group, so uh, and quite a few of those in the world making their ways into in you know, a poor neighborhoods, you know, continued to stay there as community organizers, you know? uh, and they were very much in you know, a seeing you know, and all of these languages regarding the detrimental uh, impact of in you know, a commercial redevelopment, the nexus between the state you know, and 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 Jebel were a large conglomerate. That kind of political economic understanding of that in you know, the uh, process of urbanization and urban development was largely you know, bet, you know, that kind of you know, discourse was largely benefiting from such you know, politically active in you know, groups of students, former students, you know, who already had that kind of education training you know, in academic jargons and, and, and scientific critical literature, basically using those as a way of educating a local residents who are you know, you know, a part, of, a part of their network. So that's one group. The second group is basically the resident themselves. You know. Some of these residents you know, who are uh, uh, more actively involved, you know, basically you know, they themselves having this political awakening and being the leaders of community uh, uh, act activism. And, and they were more powerful because they were coming from the you know, resident groups you know, uh, while you know, the externally you know, uh, uh, originating you know, student groups were more kind of outsiders, but these are insiders, they are resident themselves. You know. So many of these uh, protesters you know, who are uh, who are evicting in you know, a neighborhood re uh, demolition, usually these organizations will be seeing the leaders you know, who are actually one of some of those uh, uh, local residents, you know, uh, and they they basically, basically occupy the leadership positions you know, with the help of some of the activists you know, uh, from outside, and they themselves are you know, going through this in you know, a political awakening and so on, and therefore in you know, a in you know, that in you know, becoming the major driving in you know, a. Uh, uh, drivers of uh, such activism. So that will be my initial in response. And, and they actually kind of leading to, uh, you know, in line with the you know, democratization movement. And this is where the, you know, I was showing the, uh, you the inaugural assembly of the National Coalition for Housing Rights. And this is where, you know, the attempt to go beyond the, the local isolated domain, kind of trying to have more cross-regional and national level, you know, organizational uh, momentum to be, Aspire to, and I think this is where it differs from in a, in a um, uh, from Chinese context. I mean, part of my research has also been about China's experience, and China is very in a the cross regional and cross class alliance becoming very much a source of in a major brutal oppression by the state. And I think that in a, any kind of attempt to go in a, to achieve in a cross class alliance, the students are working with workers, and that becomes a major source of in a, a, a 
were in, I guess, in oppression by the state. The same goes to cross regional. Anything that goes, try goes beyond village or beyond a city, reach out to another province and uh, to produce horizontal network and open up and protest, protest becomes again and the target of uh, the state violence and oppression as well. Whereas in South Korea, with the help of democratization, which was at the national level, uh, I think there has been continuous uh, effort to build a national level organization that can bring together re more locally isolated kind of activism and put those into umbrella, uh, on, on, uh, 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 covered by the umbrella organization that uh, began to emerge at national level. That, that's exactly the point, right? Why didn't the South Korean regime, particularly before democratization, why didn't it stop such cross region, cross class? Why, why didn't they stop? <laughs> right, why didn't it stop it, right? If you were, uh, <laughs> we were if, if it was a smart autocrat, right? You should have, you know, have done it earlier, right? What happened? Well, I mean, we are at the moment, I mean, our, our discussion now is kind of looking at the entire uh, kind of uh, the history of in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, right? I mean, we are looking at looking back at that in a, uh, looking back at the time, but when you're actually in a uh, situated within the history, within the time, the temporal dimension, of course there were a lot of oppressions, you know, sub, you know, you know, uh, you know, you know uh, violence, and and this is why I was referring to how the coercion through the use of the state violence and, and force was dominating in the especially in the 70s and 80s when the you know, we had there was more authoritarian state which was you know more eager to uh, uh, resort to the use of the power in a very violent and undemocratic way of course there were many protesters many activists who were detained and they were suppressed and attempts to produce more national level in a large scale in organization being of constant sub, 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 well, subject to constant surveillance and and, and 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 so on arrest and so on so yes of course this it was there but you know this is where nationwide in the process of democratization becoming very influential and especially that in achievement you know, uh, was you know, leading to opening the space of rad opening more, more of the radical space that was used in a very effectively and captured more effectively um, by in a subsequent in a movement uh, in the 1990s, uh, um, which was leading to the establishment of uh, major organizations in the domain of labor activism, in the domain of you know, social activism, and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. I, I think this is the topic, uh, democratization deserving another talk or other talks. <laughs> But now let's uh, move on to uh, the, uh, another question from the audience. So uh, from Gu Bin uh, Jiang. Uh, so his question is that historically the efforts to provide affordable and sustainable housing to low-income households have been made by the government or government-owned uh, companies. However, this led to some, I mean, the government provided housing, right? Led to some problems such as inconsistent housing price policies according to different government and inefficiency of, 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 of such policies, right? So he believes that because of this, private sector should eventually, he believes, right, eventually take the major roles in developing sustainable housing with their own business uh, incentives. So using market rather than the government to solve the problem, right? However, most uh, private companies that in, uh, implement the social housing or public housing programs are relying on the government's subsidies and this aspect makes this private sector's participation uh, not consistent or not effective. So regarding this, uh, Gu Bin Jong's uh, question is whether Professor uh, Xin, you know any good example of, you know, all over the world that private companies without heavily relying on the government subsidies have established sustainable and profitable business model to provide social housing for low and medium income uh, households. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there are two issues, uh, two points you know, that I can uh, 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 I can put forward in it. So one is uh, the need of having again more historic understanding of how this uh, provision of housing for poor people has been like, you know, especially in, the, in, uh, in relation to the role of the private sector and the public sector. Uh, in in the context of South Korea, you know, up until where well, let's say up until the late 1990s, you know, and this is. Uh, where basically report, here I'm referring to the historical event of an you know, Asian financial crisis. So a lot of things have changed then after the Asian financial crisis because the Asian financial crisis in 1997 and 1998 
which basically made it South Korea bankrupt and have, having to rely heavily on IMF and the support uh, to come out of bankruptcy. Um, it also, it, the moment was also uh, a, a major you know, uh, political event as well, largely because you know, it led to the realization that there has been very you know, poor protection you know, uh, established by the state you know, for the poor people who are unable to uh, cope with the economic hardship at the time of the you know, financial crisis. And also, you know, the uh, the lower rank of middle classes, you know, who are falling into you know, poor people group, you know, because of their, you know, uh, because of the economic hardship, and that led to the expansion of uh, the welfare, uh, the safety, well, basically the safety net, you know, by the state, you know, to provide minimum guarantee of living, you know, for the poor. Um, so that was what uh, you know, came to be implemented you know, throughout the 2000. The, you know, the first 10 years of 21st century in South Korea was also the, the history of you know, the expand, expansion, especially the first five, seven years under more liberal government you know, led by President Kim Dae-jung uh, and Noh Moo Hyun. Well, seeing the expansion of this uh, social safety net you know, for the poor people. And it was only then that we see the public you know, sector engaging more with uh, the uh, the need of an you know, expansion of meaningful public you know, you know, housing uh, for the poor people or for the, you know, the world's off. Before the Asian financial crisis, although South Korean government cooperation uh, uh, for housing and land construction were providing, were you know, expanding their output you know, in the forms of public sector housing output, but these were very much a commercially oriented activity actually. So a lot of these units were with the expectation of being converted into own occupation and commercial units uh, uh, to be individually owned and after certain years. So you came with like, a, many of them came with five year limited period after which they exit the public housing sector and turn into private ownership. Right. So a lot of these were in that way, and 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 also at the time, you know, throughout in in the seventies, eighties, what can be seen as brick and mortar subsidy you know, given to builders. There were a lot of these in you know, the subsidies to private sector as well for their own commercial operation. Um. So in that regard, and you know, I think that, that in a story of you know what what it means to have public sector contribution to housing provision for the you know, poor people in South Korea, uh, I think that needs to be a little more you know, complicated. We don't know if there's any meaningful model of private sector in, in engaging. Well, I think this is again very difficult you know, uh, 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 issue. I mean, uh, almost all in, in all cases, and you know, the private sector, private companies are probably you know engaging in a in a probably in a marginal way. You know, they may do this as part of their kind of you know what is it like a, 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 a uh, CSR and you know, corporate social responsibility, perhaps. You know, some of the Chinese companies see actually the expansion of the market in social housing sector, actually. Uh, so in, in more recent years, some companies, even the, in the large companies, were you know, kind of expanding you know, their business in the provision of you know, social housing uh, because they see this as a growing market that they can actually tap into uh, for the expansion of their own you know, uh, uh, housing business. But I think in, a, in usually in a, in a more profit in a dominating in a kind of in a, in a economic system, I think probably in a developers find it very, uh, apart from a very small number, and I guess they are finding this in a very, uh, 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 well, not as meaningful as in a uh, uh, engaging fully in a more commercial uh, way, especially in the last in like, two decades or so across the world, we see the expen huge expansion of uh, profit generated by real estate uh, and commercial housing construction across the world and 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 where, wherever you see you know you see you know, the huge you know, support from the government to expand the property market and you know, property sector and therefore I guess there's less incentive you know, uh, for such you know, private companies to engage if you want to look at if you want to look at them if you want to look up the model uh, I think uh, it, it'll be better to look at uh, well, the community sector or the civil society uh, or, or third sector, whatever name you give to it. So like, for example, in a, a community land trust, for example, that kind of model, which actually brings together you know, uh, uh, community groups uh, to you know, produce you know, a particular model of development that builds on the, uh, the contributions from the members of the, the uh, 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 community land trust. 
for housing cooperatives, you know, which actually you know, bring together some of the more uh, usually small scale, socially uh, uh, small scale you know, architecture companies that have social awareness, working with community groups to have a small scale you know, experimental you know, implementation schemes, which can be found you know, in, 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 in several you know, cities across the world. I guess to, and that also exists in South Korea as well. Um, and not recently, but previously, you know, uh, Seoul mayor uh, was also implementing in you know, a more socially oriented program that was involving uh, subsidies given to uh, uh, sm some of the small farms and you know, uh, um, housing cooperatives to uh, experiment with a small scale intervention you know, to uh, produce more affordable housing. Uh, or longer term uh, lease and uh, 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 occupation by poor people and, and having this kind of you know, producing a small scale in a housing estate you know, as part of experimentation. So those do exist. Uh, the question is how much they are able to actually expand the scale of their business uh, in the context of this very hugely profit driven real estate market that has become the characteristic during the last in a couple of decades. We may see something different, I guess, and uh, going forward you know, with the whole we are seeing we are in the middle of this kind of potential uh, shifting of the, the landscape of housing market, real estate market, with the uh, changing economic and situations across the world, right? So uh, I guess there might be more room as there's uh, you know, more likelihood of you know, having housing crisis you know, uh, looming over many people's minds. Uh, that's great. Uh, so I'd like to also follow up on, on this question, basically this uh, private public uh, debate, right? Uh, Professor Jin, you are probably very uh, aware of um, that um, currently, I mean, in the US, there are also like homeless people basically everywhere in the big cities around the world, right? So your solution uh, is more, uh, so we talk about right to housing, right to city and the government is going to play a significant role to basically satisfy uh, right, the right to housing or city more like a kind of, uh, you know, human rights, right? Um, but another, uh, school which i think you are uh, yeah, probably are being critical of them right it's like think about the idea of it's not against the property hegemony right the idea is that property is so good that we want everybody to have it right it's, it's the idea is that we could we should just build more houses and make it more affordable so that we have less people on the streets i'm just i just want to i know probably are critical with this i just want to know like uh, how you think about this more probably like a new liberal or like a market approach to the housing affordability crisis. So what's, what's your opinion on this? <laughs> well, again, that's a very <laughs> interesting question and, and, and very important as, question as well. Um, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, we are living in this neoliberal world and, and, and this very much more uh, a hyper-marketized world you know, of, you know, uh, where in the property ownership, especially in these days and you know, uh, having a great significance you know, and property value has been increasing in you know, year after year and and people got, uh, come to realize well you know saving my income uh, in my bank account has no good and I mean it is at almost a zero interest rate although that has been changing <laughs> um, in more recent years but even then I mean and, uh, you know the property value has been increasing during the last uh, for many years in you know, uh, beyond expectation and uh, beyond imagination and and no matter how hard people work and how hard they save i mean no way they can actually address the gap between the increased value of property and therefore you know, you know, property you know, beyond their reach if they want to move to a larger house or move to into a better neighborhood or become a first time home buyer and you know, the gap between what they currently possess on the basis of their you know, uh, labor income you know, savings and what they have to pay for the destination house, the gap has been you know, enlarged, has, in, has enlarged so, so much. You know? So people see this in front of their eyes. You know? And, and it's, it's, it's not something you know, uh, you know, that has been circulating as rumors. It's actually what they observe in their neighborhood, in the city, and in the country. So when that happens, and, and when there's a less kind of a, you know, in a diminishing provision of social welfare, um, and this withdrawal of the state you know, from direct provision of welfare as well, and more an explicit emphasis by the state to subsidize the work of business and the work of bankers and so on. And you get, and I think there's, you know, it'll be very difficult to actually to argue that you, know, you shouldn't own a house, right? 
the question is, you know, what you know, I think there needs to have this in you know, a broader and you know, a critical you know, discussion about what it means to have a house, what it means to own a property, you know, what is the responsibility one may have you know, when they own something, right? And but this is again you know, being very much you know, on the such kind of you know, discussion is always going to be you know facing a wall when you know the government basically you know. <laughs> Across the world, in a, in, a, in a, almost without exception, and constantly implement these policies to subsidize the, the work of business, even though they take a large chunk of in a profit, you know, protect ring fence, right? So I think this is you know uh, uh, where it, the whole idea, and, the, and this is why I was you know in, at the start of my talk, you know, re referring to the property as hegemony as well. I mean that in our understanding being so hugely influential and impactful that. Any meaningful discussion to go against in you know, such in you know, a uh, 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 practice you know, or immediately in you know, a basis the uh, the response and what is the alternative you know? so how do you go about you know from here to to the next and how do you fill the gap you know so people may understand we don't need to own a house as you were saying you know, we can as long as the tenure is secure you know, because if 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 there's a guarantee that I don't have to buy a house but there's a house that I can live in until my death, until you know, uh, uh, and then I guess there had maybe less incentive among people to own a house. But you know, there has to be a more society-wide changes, you know, unless uh, and it can't be something that can be depending very much on individual uh, kind of determination. It has to involve systematic change, and having that systematic change is going to be a long-term process, obviously, and, and uh, very often incremental. And there's always this gap between immediate survival need of you know, individuals as of now, and the long, the kind of you know, the, uh, the long-term goals uh, that are associated with this, uh, the need of in you know, a societal and systematic change. And very often, the, the the gap between where you stand and the destination will be basically putting a lot of people in the constant agony. You know, how should I? How you know should I feel address this gap between where I am and where the society should be? And that gap can often be not just a few years, but it can be 10, 20 years. And how can you speak to these people about you know what what you need to do? You know, you know, what is the response to you know, the question of well, I understand the need, but you know, what should I do in the next 10, 20 years when I have to survive in the society and I know there has been lack of support from the state from elsewhere and there's always the emphasis on your own individual cap capability being the main source of in you know, individual waste generation so how do i do this so this is where going back to your point with reference to neoliberal society this is the dilemma this is the uh, huge you know the constraint and you know, basically put in place by the neoliberalization where no matter how much what sort of discussion we, we end up having, it, we always come come back to come comes come back to this question of individual capacity building, right? Which is very very crazy demand, and and, and the uh, uh, the framework the neoliberalization has put put in place. So this also co goes back to the whole idea of you know diminishing fertilization of you know uh, the you know the larger scale you know, the network of you know, solidarity and protest you know so the you know uh, the individualization uh, has also produced this uh, you know, diminishing role or diminishing presence of nationwide network you know across in you know, a class alliance or cross region alliance even in South Korea nowadays you know, this cross class alliance has become much weaker um, and this is another problem South Korea has faced, despite the rich history of labor activism and you know, social activism, the kind of an alliance that was characterizing the country's democratization in the 1980s, uh, is not there you know, in, in the same degree. And nowadays it's more about really the isolation. You know? Even the labor activism has been you know, uh, seeing the fragmentation where the large factory you know, uh, uh, regular workers uh, organizing trade unions and, you know, all of these in a trade, large scale factory based the trade union, more established among the established workers, often being subject to crit crit criticism because they are criticized uh, of you know, reinforcing their own protection without extending their hand in you know, their you know, support to irregular workers or more precarious workers. So, that even that in you know, a uh, sector of fragmentation within labor uh, 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 activism, uh, labor movement. Has also characterized the South Korean society nowadays, and and the cross class alliance are also becoming very much in you know, a weaker 
seeing the seeing a weaker presence. So that also further leads to this you know, return to the individuals as solutions, you know, which is again you know, uh, the problems that we encounter nowadays. That's that's wonderful. So we probably should have a redevelopment or restructuring of the idea of property rights uh, itself, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have also, I think, just the last group of questions from uh, from actually uh, from the executive director of U.S. Asian Law Institute, the NYU Law School, uh, Catherine uh, Wyman. So her question is very much related to what you have just said about the social movement. Right? So we're, we're, we're shifting back from property rights to social movement. So the core of her question is, is basically how do we situate this uh, housing-based uh, social movement, right? In the broader context of, of social movement, right? More specifically, uh, she was asking like how important was the right to housing or this social housing uh, movement in Korea's uh, democratization process. And also, more and also more specifically, uh, in the contemporary context, right? We uh, Professor Alvarez mentioned earlier that uh, Korea was a member of the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So, I guess Catherine's question is, how does this right to housing or right to us uh, right to housing? How does it compare to, for example, other kinds of human rights or social and economic rights? Right? Has it received less? Or more attention, right? Among other, you know, other peer causes for for social movements. So, mm. how important is, is sure. this right to housing? Yeah. So I understand we are kind of reaching the end of our session. So I try to make it concise. You know, yep. So two minutes, yes. So um, starting with the second question. So again, going back to this 1989 implementation of this you know, uh, public housing provision you know, as part of the in-kind compensation measure um, for those evictees. I think that was very important because it was actually created this notion, you know, which is probably you know, uh, uh, ill-placed. You know, this notion that you know, uh, housing, the, the housing, you know, where a certain degree of housing right is being attained you know, and, and protection was kept, you know, being put in place uh, in a more institutional way, uh, even though the actual you know, condition of living has not been you know, significantly improved uh, for the you know, poor people. And you can probably you know, refer to for example, uh, the Parasite the movie where you have the kind of sub-basement living it become one of the key characteristics of urban living among the poor. I mean, so that uh, has continued. And we, we have, um, but in a sense, I mean, that kind of 1989 uh, provision you know, uh, of you know, uh, legal provision has produced this kind of, you know, you know, uh, yeah, uh, contributed to uh, the limit, limited you know, kind of a, you know, uh, to the lack of expansion of in a default of more in a discussion about what it means to actually think about housing rights in general. In comparison, and therefore in a uh, housing rights related discussion was you know, despite with the continued continual emphasis by activists, you know, it didn't really reach out to affect the entire society that much. You know, it has become more market-led solution, being very much in the minds of people, especially with the emergence of this property being major source of asset building. Whereas more social and cultural rights were beginning to emerge in the towards the 1990s and early 2000s, and this is where we get to see more uh, discussions about LGBTQ plus related discussions, uh, the migrants and you know, uh, 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 migrant rights as well emerging to become more important in a point of debate. You know? So those issues came up to be uh, uh, dominating the, the debate more recently, um, and, and and therefore there was a bit of a you know, uh, temporary you know, difference. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that's all, yeah, given the yeah. time, so I probably stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Shin. I learned a lot. I'm sure the audience, they also learned a lot. And also thanks everyone for being here and spending the time with us talking about urban social movements in South Korea and in Asia.